uh, Professor Kurt Zilm, who's a chemist, who will be telling you about his expertise, which is in magnetic resonance. And he's one of the world experts, so we're very fortunate to have him here. We're also fortunate to have him because actually he's on leave from Yale, but he's decided that he wanted to do this because he's very passionate about getting students excited about science. So let's welcome him and thank him as he comes to the podium. There I am. I guess I am on. Thanks, Anissa, and uh, thank you all for coming out this early on a, on a Saturday morning. So this is right. I'm a, what's called a nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopist. That's a, it's a big mouthful. And this is some artwork uh, from my laboratory that just shows the sorts of things that we, that we do. And what I want to do today is try to explain to you uh, how nuclear magnetic resonance works and uh, give you examples of actually where you encounter this uh, quite often in your everyday lives. So we're going to talk about investigating samples. That might be liquid chemicals, solid materials, small animals, or maybe even yourself if you're getting an MRI. And you get put in, a, in an antenna that we're going to call a probe coil that picks up signals that your body produces when you put in a really big magnet. So we've got to talk about magnets some. And those signals get analyzed by what's essentially a very fancy radio receiver and a computer. And we put out things called spectra or images. And so to, today I'm going to try to go over all the different pieces. Why is it that uh, your body is full of magnets? And how can you actually get radio waves emanating uh, out? And can we detect those? And what can we learn about, the, about uh, materials in that sort of fashion? So we're going to talk about magnetic dipoles and electromagnets. I'm going to talk about how magnets align. You all know how a compass lines up with the Earth's magnetic field. We're going to do some demonstrations of that. And something called torque. The, when you twist an, an axle and you, you make a wheel turn, that's putting a torque on. We're going to show how, how a, a magnet can produce a torque on another magnet. And that allows us to do something called Larmor precession and detect the signal through something called Faraday induction. Then we'll talk a little bit about superconductors, because this is the way we get really big magnets. Right? And we'll talk about spectral analysis. And we won't do this with NMR signals, but we'll, we'll do this with, uh, well, with volunteers from the audience, probably. Um, and then I'll, we'll talk a little bit about NMR imaging and applications in all sorts of different life from Iraq to oil well drilling uh, to chemistry. Okay. So magnets and magnetic dipoles. Right? So um, we all know uh, that a compass needle will orient uh, in the Earth's magnetic field. And magnets basically attract one another. Right? So we, a magnet will have a north pole and a south pole. The opposite poles will attract. Let's get the lights off here. And we, have, uh, we usually describe magnets by their lines of force. Right? Um, if I take, let's see, put those on the sides. Right? So what I have here is an array of compass magnets. These are all little individual magnets. And I've got a great big magnet here. Um, how big is this, is this magnet? This magnet's pretty big. Right? You can stick your tools together with these magnets and not have any. It's a very handy sort of tool chest to have. Right? Um, you don't want to get too close to your credit cards, though. It, uh, it'll take care of those in short order. Get these off. Now, I can look at the lines of force of this big magnet. When I put it on top of the little magnets, they all line up in that fashion. And right? so you can see. You know, as we have here the lines of force in this diagram, they show the lines, the magnets lining up straight here, coming out the ends, and then they, they curve around. And uh, for the science geeks, it's kind of fun to just play around and see the magnets move, right? Endless, endless, endless amusement. Um, I know Anissa would like to play with this a little bit more, so <laughs> that's why I let her use that. All right. Now, um, there are other sorts of... Uh, of ways that we can see magnetic fields. Um, and one of the more fascinating ones, as I've shown you, we can always you know, pick up tools in this sort of a fashion. So a magnet will take something that's magnetizable right, and turn it into a magnet, and they'll attract. And you can pick one up with the other. One of the coolest materials around is something called a ferrofluid. So it's like the black oil from the X-Files. Right? Right? Um, and it, uh, you know, it just sort of moves around here in this, this tube until I get a magnet close to it, right? And 
you see it go in the lines of force, right? And I can sit here and oh, sort of move it back and forth. Again, this is this is endless hours of fun playing with this, right? And uh, in fact, there are artists that use this to make kinematic sculptures. Right? And so basically, what's happening is the the magnetic particles. These are little tiny iron nanoparticles that are in an organic matrix, and then they're suspended here in a in a organic fluid that's clear, right? And they're showing the lines of force that that we have on the magnet. So magnets have lines of force, and they uh, attract other magnets. OK. Let's go on to the, there we go. Right now, the magnets that I've just shown you are, this will pop up, are permanent magnets. Right? We can also make uh, magnets by taking a current and running it through wire. So if we, if we have a loop of wire, and we run a current through it, and many of you have probably done this before, put it around a, an iron nail to make an electromagnet. When you run the current through that, you'll, you'll get an electromagnet. And that electromagnet is just like these permanent bar magnets. This just shows a couple of pairs of loops and the lines of force. And I have a big one here uh, that, uh, that I can uh, demonstrate. And uh, if I run current through this particular electromagnet, I can make it orient. Now this billiard ball that I have here, we're going to play with this a lot. This is a, is also is a magnet. If I can get it here, yep. It's also is a magnet. They, they stick together and it's going to orient in this magnetic field. Actually, maybe I can take the big one and stick it in here, right? So if I have no current, the magnetic field, can you see that in the back? You see that it could jump up like that? All right. All right. As I turn the current over, I'll have to knock it over, but if I turn the current up, right? it'll jump up in that sort of a fashion. Right? So for those of you that couldn't see that, I can probably go to the next screen and we'll just look at that in the video. So here again, I have this billiard ball on an air bearing. So I've got air blowing up underneath this. And what I've just done there is turn the current on, all right? if it's working well. All right? So I turn it up, all right? and it'll sit there and it'll, it'll bob back and forth. If I turn the current off, it falls over, right, like that. Turn it on, it'll bob back up like so. So the magnetic for field from the electromagnet is making the little magnet orient, right? So if I just let it sit there, turn the magnetic field off, it'll just fall over because the weight of gravity is going to make it fall over because it's got that little knob on the top, right? So I can make an, a one magnet orient in the magnetic field of another, and electromagnets are convenient ways of doing that. Now, why do we care? Well, it's because you're full of magnets. And to explain that, we first have to talk about matter. So the things we want to investigate are all made of matter. And matter is made of molecules. Right? So matter is made of molecules. Molecules are made of atoms. So these are the components of air, or many of the components of air. I'm looking for, I've got too many toys out here, and I can lose my laser pointer. I like being at Toys R Us for a scientist. Right? <laughs> Right. Don't know which one to play with first. So nitrogen is in air, and it, it, it's dinitrogen molecules. It's got two atoms of nitrogen. Oxygen is in air, two atoms of oxygen. CO2, the greenhouse gas you all hear about, it's got an atom of carbon and two atoms of oxygen in this sort of arrangement. Bigger molecules, we represent them as how we stick the atoms together, you know, sort of uh, like connects. Right? And so here we have ethanol. And in green, I've showed two carbon atoms. The white ones are the hydrogen atoms. There's an oxygen. and there's a hydrogen. So that's the structure of that molecule is we stick those atoms together. And bigger molecules, well, they have many, many, many more atoms. So molecules are arrangements of different types of atoms. Now, the atoms themselves have a structure, right? And the atoms are, consist of electrons. So those are the negative charges that are the currents, carriers of electricity, right? And the negative charges will be attracted by positive charges, right? The nucleus of every atom is a positive charge and different elements have different sizes of positive charge, right? And different numbers of electrons. They balance one another out, right? So the simplest element, hydrogen, right, that we hear a lot about is you know, the, the, the molecular hydrogen that we want to burn as a fuel. That atom has got a single positive charge in the nucleus called a proton with an electron going around it. Right? Carbon atoms, right, have actually six protons and six electrons, right? So that makes them different. They also happen to have six neutrons that don't have any charge, but it makes the atom heavier. Right? And I can have different isotopes 
Deuterium is another kind of hydrogen. It's called heavy hydrogen. You've probably heard of that uh, in books about nuclear reactors. And that has an extra neutron in the nucleus that makes it different than hydrogen. The molecules stick together when the, when the atoms share electrons, and that lets them bind to one another. Now, why do we care? Well, different nuclei have different structures, and in molecules, they have different arrangements of electrons. And it turns out that the nuclei themselves are magnetic. Right? There are many nuclei are magnetic, and they act just like this little bar magnet. And they'll align in a magnetic field. So all this, you're mostly water, and, you're, and water has got lots of hydrogen atoms. Right? And so the, all those protons will just align in a magnetic field. In fact, in the Earth's magnetic field, right, we'll, as we'll show you, your, your protons are all processing right now. Right? Right? So they'll line up in a field, and there's lots of different nuclei. Protons, carbon-13 is, is an isotope of carbon at 1% natural abundance. Nitrogen-15 and phosphorus-31 are all important nuclei for magnetic resonance. Now, to explain how we do magnetic resonance, I have to explain to you not only why nuclei have a magnetic moment, but they also have something called angular momentum. And angular momentum uh, is a key property that allows us to detect the fact that the nuclei of your body spin in a magnetic field. Right? And so you've all seen a figure skater uh, you know, spinning around, and when they move their arms in, they'll spin faster. That's due to the conservation of angular momentum. Now, I need a volunteer. I need a volunteer. Let's see here. Let's see here. Let's see here. Oh, we'll go with the one in the front here. Come on. Come on down. We'll do a, we'll do a couple. OK, you can come take a look, too. OK, now, this is a big gyroscope. All right, let me get it to go. All right, and if I let it go, it's going to spin. Now, why don't you sit down on the stool here. All right, I'm going to you know, just sit on down. What's your name? Carson. Carson? How are you doing today, Carson? OK, now, I want you to stick your hands out. I'm going to. I'm going to hand this to you, right? And hold it out away from yourself, all right? Now, try to twist it. Go, go, get, whoops. Okay, stick your feet out. Get your foot off the, yeah, stick your feet. Now do it again. Now stick your, now twist. <laughs> okay? Turn it back the other way. You got to keep your feet off the ground. I got to get, pick volunteers with shorter legs. Here, let's try this again. <laughs> so put your, put your, Put your, put your feet on the, up, up here on the stool, and we'll try this again. Let me get this going faster. OK. Now twist it. Twist it 90 degrees. Just twist it 90 degrees. There you go. All right, so this is the conservation of the angular momentum. It, it, the, the angular momentum wants to be conserved. And when you twist this over, it imparts it to yourself instead. If you turn it the other way, you'll go in the opposite direction. There you go. <laughs> OK. Of course, now if it stops, if you twist it, it doesn't do anything. And it, won't, and, it won't, and it won't turn over. And everyone afterwards can try it. We'll let everybody come down afterwards. We have plenty of time. We have lots of demonstrations. Thank you very much, Carson. Now, there's another demonstration of this, just to let you see that this will not tip over. There's a Restoring force, you know, gravity wants to make this tip over if I stick it on its side. Right? So I get this going right, and stick it on the stand here. Right? It doesn't fall over. Right? And the angular momentum is transferred to the stand. And if I don't grab it pretty soon, it's going to fall off. Right? Of course, when it does stop, you know, there's nothing, nothing holding it. Gravity will pull it over. Right? So we're going to see that the fact that nuclei also have angular momentum is key, right? So if I have uh, a nuclear moment, right, uh, it has charge and it spins. Spinning charge makes a magnet, just like an electromagnet, right? So I have both angular momentum and a nuclear magnet. And if I put that in a magnetic field, it's going to process. Now, we'll come down and let you look at this little device that I have here afterwards. If I, if I were to take this, the magnet, and you probably won't be able to see this if I do it here, but we see if it's just sitting here, it turns over. But if I can spin this by hand, oh, I can't do it very well. If I were to take my drill here and spin it by hand, what you'll see 
is that the top just spins. And it won't come back up because of the magnetic field. Now, if I turn the magnetic field on, what happens is it starts to rotate around. Now, here I've turned the magnetic field on about halfway. Right? And that determines the rate at which it's turning around. Right? If I crank the current up twice as far, make the magnetic field bigger, then the top starts to spin faster. Right? Right? So I have a, a magnet with angular momentum in a magnetic field. It'll spin around. If I stop, turn the current off, it stops. If I turn the current in the opposite direction, make the magnet point in the other direction, then the magnet will process in the opposite direction. So when you are put into an MRI machine, as we'll, as we'll talk about, your protons are all processing about that magnetic field. Right, now, what, what uh, use is that? Well, the use of that is that we can detect that signal by looking at the radio waves that you can detect through a process known as magnetic induction. Right? Now, this is a device that we use to demonstrate this. I've got a little uh, ammeter to the side. And this detects when a current flows through one of these coils. Faraday's law of induction says if I take a magnet and move it in a coil, I'll induce a current, and I'll see an electromotive force. So if I take, for instance, my ferrofluid here, right? It doesn't do anything because it's not permanently magnetized. But if I take this large magnet, I deflect the needle. Okay. So if I have a moving magnet that moves back and forth, I'll make an oscillating current. And you're all actually somewhat uh, uh, familiar uh, with this, in that uh, if you go up to the Housatonic River and look at a power plant that's uh, using uh, hydroelectric power, Basically, the water is flowing to turn a turbine, and the turbine has got some, it's got some permanent magnets stuck to the end of it. And there's a coil of wire around that. And those moving magnets then induce an electric current into the power lines that feeds our homes. Right? The reverse sort of process works in a motor, where you put a current into a coil. That makes an oscillating field that takes the permanent magnets on the shaft and turns those around as well. Right? So you've seen this process you know, used in everyday life you know, all the time. And once we have electric cars, that's, you know, that's, that's how we'll, we'll, see, we'll see this all the time. Now, nuclear induction right, works in the same sort of way. I have a coil. It's going to be my sensor coil. And my nuclear moment is going to be the thing that's rotating. Right? And that nuclear moment, when it rotates, then, will induce a signal uh, in, uh, in the magnet. All right, now, let's, let's talk about uh, how we induce these sorts of signals and how we, we think about them. Now, it's hard to demonstrate the nuclear magnetic resonance experiment uh, here in a demonstration that you can see. I mean, the nuclear moments are very tiny. But we can look at how a microphone works. And that's a very similar sort of a process. So a microphone it has a diaphragm uh, attached to a coil. And when you speak, you make sound waves that go, that go out. And they'll vibrate that diaphragm and move the coil next to a permanent magnet. Well, that's going to induce a signal here. Right? And we're going to be able to record those. So I'm going to. I've got this little software program in my PC here that lets me turn it into an oscilloscope. All right. And now I need another volunteer. Someone who can whistle. Can whistle. All right, right over here on the on the aisle. Yep, yep. Come on up. Come up, son. All right. So in here we go. All right, come on up. <laughs> All right, so. We say Science Saturdays, right? So can you whistle? Yep, so you see? We're picking up the whistle with the microphone on the side of the, of the, of the, of the computer. Whistle again. OK, so that's, that's a good one. All right, so now what we're going to do is we'll, we'll capture that. If we, if we'll, we'll go and now look at what happens when we, we analyze this by doing something called a Fourier transform. Now, the oscillating signal that we saw, saw uh, from the uh, microphone goes into the computer, and we apply an operation called a Fourier transform. And what that does is it takes that single tone, that single oscillation period, out of the signal and produces a, a graph where I plot the frequency. That's how many times per second we go from up to down to up to down. That's the frequency of the signal and its amplitude. So this is the Fourier transform. So we can run the program again and actually, actually 
look at the Fourier transform of your whistle. Right? So we're going to see what sort of a spectrum that is. So we're going to put it in frequency mode here instead. All right. Now go ahead and whistle as loud as you can. Let's see if we can see it here. Now I don't have the right frequencies. Okay, go ahead and whistle. Oh, we've got to go louder than that. Whoops, it's not armed. Let's turn it on. Now try. <laughs> okay, so let's, let's see if we can just pick, pick one of those, all right? So whistle, whistle loud again. Oh, not loud enough. Okay, let's see here if we can do this. Do this like so. Of course it's not, there we go. All right, so here I have the spectrum of a time domain signal. If I could get this to be just a whistle again. All right, so here we have a whistle. I want you to have a seat. All right, so this is my single tone from that whistle. You notice that this spectrum is very different than when we were just talking and making noise in the audience. We had lots of peaks coming up. A whistle has a single peak in it. If I look at the frequency of this, I can measure that by clicking on it. All right, and it says the frequency here is about 1840 hertz. If I look in the time domain all right, of that signal, and this is a graph now that shows how uh, this is, is going back and forth. I'll spread it out in time. And now I can come in and measure the period, how often the signal repeats itself, right? And that's the frequency. And again, it's about 1800 hertz, right? So this time-dependent signal, right, when we analyze it, right, gives us a spectrum, right? And so we can look at, for instance, if I can go back to the frequency domain and I say, hello? Whoops, let's go back again. Arm it. Science! Nope. Not, not loud enough. Let's go to this first. All right, now if I'm science, Saturdays. All right, so here I have many peaks that popped up in the spectrum. And if I look at the time domain signal, all right, I'll see that I have a whole bunch of different frequencies that are in that. All right, and so what we're going to, to do is we're going to take nuclear induction signals that have lots of, lots of wiggles in them and analyze them in terms of their spectrum. And each one that's going around at its own rate will give a different peak in the spectrum. Right? OK. Now, let's see if I exit this. All right. Now, I could do this, sort of show you how I could do this with a rotating magnet. All right? So all the lights on. So I can't show you a spin. But I can turn one of my magnets into a spin. Right? So I'll take one of my strong neodymium iron boron magnets. I'm going to turn it into a spin that I can spin like this. All right? And then the receiver coil that I have right, is a bunch of coils of wire. Right? And I can now plug this into the PC in place of my microphone. Right? Now if I go back and turn the, turn the PC into an oscilloscope again. All right. And now look at the time domain signals that we're going to get out of this. All right. Yeah, this will work. All right. So if I you know, move the laser pointer by this, it does, does absolutely nothing. But if I get, the, I get the frequency range, it's very hard to get this frequency to be high enough because I can't spin this that fast. But now if I take my nuclear moment and I bring this by, right, I start to link the lines of force, I can now make a nuclear induction signal. All right? And so that nuclear induction signal, it gets pointy, it's going to hurt my computer. All right? This nuclear induction signal now comes from the moving magnet. If the magnet's not moving, you notice it goes back and forth, that's because I turn the magnet one way and then the other way and one way and the other way. Right? All right. So, I can induce a signal into a coil, and that's going to be the basis of the nuclear magnetic resonance experiment. Now, a couple of guys, uh, Ed Purcell and Felix Bloch, uh, back in the 50s, invented this technique. And they got the Nobel Prize for it. Uh, the reason they got the Nobel Prize, and what, why did they invent this? Well, they invented this, this technique because the frequency that a given element will 
nutate about a magnetic field depends on its gyromagnetic ratio. That's just a fancy name for what's that proportionality. Right? And that tells you something about the structure of the nucleus, how the protons and neutrons are put together. Right? That's something that you usually have to do in a huge facility, an accelerator facility. This was tabletop physics, and this was great that you could do this. Right? So these guys got the Nobel Prize basically for figuring out how to measure the gyromagnetic ratio in tabletop physics and learn a lot about nuclear structure. Now, unfortunately for the physicists, as they try, and they always do this, physicists try to measure things precisely and then more precisely and more precisely. More precisely meant making a better magnetic field that was more uniform across the sample. You see if this field is different at one end of the sample than the other, then one end of the sample gives a different frequency than the other end does. Right? That was a problem they had broad line. And as they made it narrower and narrower, what they found is that you put it in a molecule like ethanol, that you got more than one line. The geromagnetic ratio was different depending on the sample. So that was, that was bad news for physics. Right? They, they didn't like that. They called it the chemical shift. That was the most derogatory term they could come up with. I mean, you know, <laughs> chemists you know, did this sort of thing. But this was just great for chemistry. It's a serendipitous discovery, and magnetic resonance just permeates chemistry now. And you know, this is, is an example of sort of the difference between what you, what you might call hypothesis-driven research. Say you're interested in photosynthesis, and you have some idea of how it works. You design an experiment, and you test it out to see what happened, versus what might be called the engineering model of research, where you get a new capability so you can discover things. You know, it's sort of like building the Golden Gate Bridge. And there was an idea, yeah, you could get it from one side to the other. But all the other stuff that came about because they built that, no one would have believed the development and, and the traffic it would have had until it was built. The integrated circuit's the same sort of thing. Well, they could make circuitry more efficient. But the notion that we would actually would have personal computers, much less Wii's, you know, or Xboxes, you know, was just totally, whoops, there's a reminder. Yep, I think I'm here. OK? Yeah, I think I'll dismiss that one, right? Um, uh, you know, we, we just couldn't have imagined that. And so there's a lot of important scientific advances that come about because of serendipity. This is, was an example of discovering the chemical shift, right? Uh, and being able to use this to analyze matter is an example of a serendipitous discovery, right? So let's see what we've talked about so far. We talked about how if we take a sample, it has magnetic moments. Anything in, in the, in the, in, around us has got magnetic moments. We put it in a coil. They're going to move, and if we put them in a magnetic field, right, and then we'll get a big signal out. And we'll take that signal and analyze the frequencies, and we'll be able to learn about the structure of matter. Right? So I said we need big magnets. Now, why do we need big magnets? Well, big magnets make the signals bigger. Right? We want bigger magnets to do that. It makes it a lot easier to um, detect the signals in this sort of a fashion. Um, and so we make bigger and bigger and bigger magnets. Now, the Earth's field would give a proton a frequency about the frequency of that whistle, about 1,700 cycles per second or hertz. Right? When you get in an MRI, it's a frequency more like 64 megahertz. That's like the frequencies on your FM radio about. Right? We have an instrument here at Yale that uh, allows us to do NMR at 800 megahertz. That's up where TV signals happen to be. Right? Now, how do we make these great big magnets? Well, we do this through the use of what are called superconductors. Right? When you put current through these coils, if you came up here afterwards and you felt the coils with the current that I'm putting through them, it gets hot. The coils can only carry so much current because they have a finite resistance to the flow of electricity. Right? To make the biggest magnets around, uh, we would end up melting the windings. And so we use something called a superconductor that has no resistance. We can put as much current as we want through it. Problem is we have to get the superconductors very, very low. Now, I can't demonstrate how a superconductor loses uh, its, uh, its, uh, its, its resistance. Um, that easily, but I can, I can show how a superconducting transition takes place when I, when I pour some liquid nitrogen on a superconductor. So, I'm going to show you an example of magnetic levitation using uh, what's known as a high temperature superconductor. And let's see if we can put this up on the screen. So we'll try to put the demonstration. There we go. So what I have uh, here uh, next to, to, and we have to, have to thank Velma, my, my, my wife sitting right here. Could you raise your hand, please? Thank her for letting me use her video camera.
Well, I'm cooling this down. I'm, I'm curious now. Now, many of you heard about this on the radio, but how many of you are here because you went to school with one of my six kids? No one's going to admit it. Yeah, there's a, yeah, okay, there's a few. All right, so what I have here is a, a, one of those little rare earth magnets. All right, those are, these are one of these little tiny magnets. And I have a sample of a yttrium barium copper oxide superconductor. It's just a, just a, a disc that's not magnetic. You know, this doesn't, it doesn't attract whatsoever. Right? Um, and this becomes a superconductor somewhere around the temperature of liquid nitrogen. Right? And so if I pour the liquid nitrogen on this and try to cool the disc down, you know, it's kind of sloppy. Let's do a little better job here. As I cool it down, uh, this is going to go superconducting. And what will happen is that the magnetic lines of force will be excluded from the superconductor. And we're going to see the magnet levitate. So it's getting close. Let's see if I can do a little more on here. Is it going to go? Is it boiling away? Getting closer. I'm being too ginger with it. But I want to try to avoid doing this point. There we go. All right, so now it's there, sitting there. It's levitating above the superconductor, right? And I can sit here and it'll just sit there and it'll just spin in the air. All right, as it levitates. All right, so it's just, it's just sort of, you know, this is, this is not exactly how they did that scene in The Exorcist with the bed, right? <laughs> but it's the same sort of thing, right? And if we sit here and wait for the liquid nitrogen to, to, to cool off, we'll see that uh, the, the magnet will just fall back down uh, onto, onto, uh, onto the superconductor. Now, how cold is this liquid nitrogen? I mean, it's pretty cold. Um, Yet again, I've lost my laser pointer. Here it is. Right? So the temperature scale you're familiar with is the Fahrenheit one, right? where water boils at 212. If you look at your temperature gauge in your auto, you see it's at 200 and some odd degrees. You're in trouble with your radiator. Right? We know it freezes at 32 degrees. Right? A warm day is somewhere up here around 70, and a really cold day in Connecticut is down here around zero. Right? Liquid nitrogen is down here at minus 321 degrees. Right? So this stuff is awfully cold. You don't want to get this on your feet, right? right. It, it sits here and it just, it just boils, you know, it disappears, right, as it uh, tries to cool down the terrazzo, which it really can't do. If I got any left here? Oh, I don't have any left here. I'll have to get some more, right? More afterwards, right? And we actually, in making these strong magnets, use liquid helium, all right? So the gas that goes in balloons, and that's at minus 453 degrees Fahrenheit. You can't get any colder than minus 459. That's what we call absolute zero on the Kelvin scale. Right? This is a cross section of a superconducting magnet. Let me put that on the center screen. Did that fall down yet? It did fall down yet. Right. So if we, if we look at the cross section of this superconducting magnet, whoops, what happened here? Yep. Um, we have a big coil, right? and we have a bunch of doers. Uh, vacuum vessels, essentially, thermos bottles around this that we're trying to keep the liquid helium in. Right? I'll turn this around to the side. So here's my superconducting coil, and I have a big vessel here that I have to fill with liquid helium to keep it at 4 degrees Kelvin with the niobium titanium wires that are in there to make them superconducting. And because that's going to boil off really fast, even if I have a vacuum space around it, just the heat radiating through that is going to make that boil off. What we do is we put another vacuum vessel around it and then another can that I fill with liquid nitrogen because liquid nitrogen is cheap. Okay? So we, we're always filling these devices with liquid helium and liquid nitrogen. When you go get in an MRI machine, you're in a bigger version of this and that surrounding on the outside has got a big vessel of liquid helium and a big vessel of liquid nitrogen around it. And that's why the technician leaves while you're in the room. Okay. okay. Now, with these really big magnetic fields, all right, we stick different molecules in, we get different spectra. And this is sort of a chemist's version of Sudoku puzzles, right? looking at NMR spectra. Right? Katie, can you do these? You learned about these? Yes, you learned about these. And when you take organic chemistry, you, know, you learn how to do this. So these are different molecular formulas or, 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 or stoichiometric formulas right, for different molecules, and it gives me different spectra. So how can I understand? how these different lines, right? these are the different rates at which the different protons are spinning around. There are eight protons in this molecule and 14 in this one, but they spin around the magnetic field. How can I understand what the structure is of the basis of their NMR spectrum? That's actually, it's not too, too hard to understand. So what are, the, what are the, the origins? 
So the nuclear spin doesn't see just the field of the superconducting magnet, but it sees the field that the molecule puts on it. There's electrons in there, and the electrons move around. Now, if, if, it's, if I'm in an atom, the electrons sort of bounce off the nucleus, and, and this is where I would see the, the NMR spectrum of an, of an atom. But when I, when I have electrons in the atom, it turns out the electrons, when they move in a magnetic field, they curve. That's how your old TV set works. It's got an electron beam that goes out and hits the phosphor, and there's a magnet that moves that beam and rasters it back and forth. And so because the electrons move in a curved path, they make a magnetic field. And it's proportional to the size of the applied magnetic field. That's called the shielding. So the line moves depending on how many electrons are around. So different parts of the molecule, you see different amounts of this chemical shielding, as the physicists called it. Now there are other nuclei in the molecule. So it's not just there's a single proton. There's other protons nearby, and they're little magnets. And those little magnets see each other's fields. So I see a field from one magnet due to, due to the other. So it sees a shift because of that little dipolar field. And it turns out because of a quant what's called a quantum mechanical effect, these nuclei only arrange themselves in the magnet in two ways. We, we, you can see that they should line up. It turns out that they can also be lined upside down perfectly. And they have those two possible orientations. Right? And so that means that not only do I see a field from the magnet in this direction, I'll see a field from the magnet in that direction. So instead of one line, I get two because he sees a neighbor. And the size of that tells me something about the distance between the nuclei. Now, in the spectra I just showed you, we have another kind of coupling called a, we call it a J coupling, because we like to make up names for things. Right? And it's the same as that dipolar field, except it has to do with the fact that the electrons themselves have magnetic moments. And if the two nuclei have a chemical bond between them, then I'll see a field transmitted through the electrons. And it will depend on this, whether the nucleus is up or down. And so I'll get a splitting that tells me that those two nuclei have a bond. So this is really perfect for chemists. If you think of chemistry as being a Lego set, right? and you have you know, round, round Legos and square Legos, the square ones are the bonds, and the round ones are the atoms, and you stick them together, and you want to know, you know which types, which colors do I have, how are they put together, who's neighboring who. So the patterns tell me you know, there's one new one for each distinct atomic center. So that's the stoichiometry, the ratios of the elements, and they're different types. The couplings tell me how they're connected. And the number of lines tells me something about chemical equivalency. So let's do this Sudoku puzzle and figure out what the structure of this molecule happens to be. So it's got four carbons, eight hydrogens, and two oxygens. Right? And I've got three groups of signals. It tells me I've got three types of hydrogen atoms. All right? And they come in a ratio of two to three to three, because if I add up the heights of these, I get a height of two, a height of three, and I stick that one on top of that, and this on top of that, it ends up being three also. Right? That tells me, because I know some of the rules of organic chemistry, that I must have two of the hydrogens on one carbon, and the other ones come in groups of three. That's called a methyl group right, that we happen to have. So I've got three on a, on a carbon. Right? I also know, because of their positions, right, that this one that's the, that's the CH2 has got to be next to an oxygen. And then I can tell from the patterns how many neighbors they've got. Now, how does that work? Well, this guy's a single line. Right? He has no neighbors. He doesn't see anybody. So he must be a methyl that's got a bond off to something. I don't know quite what yet, but he's off by himself. This guy, well, he's got three lines. That means he's got two neighbors. Now, how, is I, how do I know that? Well, if I have two neighbors, they can both be up. They can both be down. Or I can have one up or one down. And there's two ways of doing that. Right? So I get a lines one to two to one. Oh, right? This guy's got three neighbors, because right? I've got four lines. Again, three up, three down, two down, one up, one down, two up. Right? So I have those sorts of patterns. So these guys are neighboring. So, oh, that CH3 has got to be next to that CH2. They've got to be stuck together that way. Right? Right? And then if I, by process of elimination, I have a carbon left over and an oxygen, the only way I can stick them together and make sure there are four things stuck on every carbon is to make this molecule, ethyl acetate. Right? So that's the spectrum of ethyl acetate. If I had taken and you know, made, a, made, a, made a different, made this an alcohol instead, move this, this oxygen somewhere else, I'd get a totally different spectrum. Right? So this is so important to chemistry that there's another Nobel Prize for NMR. This guy, Richard Ernst, at the, at the ETA Ha, started off as an electrical engineer, became a chemist, right? and he got the Nobel Prize for the way that we do NMR spectroscopy these days. Now, just across Long Island Sound, another guy, unfortunately, passed away last week, um, invented a technique known as NMR zoigmatography. Right? The guy was a terrible PR person. No one was going to remember zoigmatography. This sounds like a bad disease. He invented NMR imaging. This is Paul Otterberg, and he was over at Stony Brook. 
And he had this idea that we all thought was crazy at the time. He says, you know, we always try to get a perfect magnetic field. So the samples always have the same field, and every nucleus of the same type has the same tone. It makes the tone sharp. And we all know if you put a bad field on, one that varied a lot across the sample, the tone would just sound terrible. And the spectrum would be broad and would have no information. And Paul says, no, if you, if you made the field very linearly, you might be able to make an image. And this is kind of nutty. But this was the idea. So I made a plot here of magnetic field strength versus distance. All right? I've got three test tubes of water of different sizes and shapes. If I put that in the NMR machine and I had this kind of a field, the spectrum would look like this. The field at position A is BA, and I'd get this frequency, omega A. And at B, it's going to be different. Right? It's going to be a higher field. I'll get a higher frequency. Right? And there's a range of frequencies because the tube is fatter. Right? And so I would get this, the spectrum would be the image of this set of what we call phantoms. Right? So that was kind of cute, but it seemed totally impractical. Right? Until a guy named Peter Mansfield came along, and he came up with some really clever ideas of making time-dependent gradients and doing all sorts of fancy stuff. And he showed data that came out of a lemon and gave us this first image. We thought, wow, that's really cool. Um, and I was just starting graduate school at this time. I could have got into it and thought, eh, it's never going to go anywhere. You know, within two years, General Electric totally commercialized this, and we're now seeing brain scans. You know, so you, this looks at all the soft tissue in your body. And the way MRI works right, is that it's basically looking at the protons and the water, because you're mostly made of water. And of course, it became a medical technique. So the nuclear was dropped because everybody was afraid of a nuclear test. And so, you know, so it's just MRI now instead of NMRI. And Mans, uh, Mansfield and Blatterberg, they got the Nobel Prize in 2003. It's their third Nobel Prize here for NMR, right, for discovering magnetic resonance imaging. Right? Now, how many of you have had an MRI? You tell me you're lying. You've had many MRIs. How many have had an MRI with contrast? With contrast. So some of you have been injected with gadolinium compounds, right? So, so it turns out that, that when you do an MRI image, if you put magnetic particles right, in the subject, those magnetic particles will affect the signal. Right? And by affecting the signal, they can broaden the lines. And so if I look at the image, different parts of the sample have different lines so I can see where the contrast agent is. That's sort of a cool thing. right? And so they, they bind the water loosely, and that affects their N NMR. And, and there's another technique called bold imaging. It turns out this is blood oxygen level dependent contrast. Turns out that oxygen molecules have what we call unpaired electrons, and that also makes them magnetic. And so wherever there's oxygen molecules, that affects the line widths in the same way as the contrast agents. Now, when you think your metabolism either uses up oxygen or gives off oxygen into the blood, right? And so the oxygen levels will move around in your head as you think. And so we can use this to detect things like this. So here are some brain images of a, two groups of patients, right? And they're being spoken to. Right? right? You notice this group here, they're using both, where it's lighting, lighting up, that's where I have this bold contrast. And they're using both sides of their brain right? when they're listening to speech. This other group is defective in some way. Right? They're only using one side of their brain to speak. Anybody got a clue as to what's wrong with group A? Men. They're men, yes. <laughs> These are men. These are women. Right? All the women are laughing. Yeah, the guys are going, yeah, yeah, yeah. Our wives didn't need to know this, right? right? I prefer to think that what we're, we're, we are only being told things that are you know, worth using half our brains to listen to, but you know, that's just my take on it, right? Okay. So there, there, there are all sorts of things we can do, we can do with, with, with MRI imaging, and, and it's just amazing the, the sorts of experiments one can do be, because of this. Now, another thing uh, that you can do with NMR is you can determine the structures of really big molecules. And that's something that's akin to the research that I do. Um, uh, proteins uh, are molecules that uh, really uh, you know, uh, make us work. I mean, if we didn't have proteins, you know, we, just, we, just, we just wouldn't work. All sorts of things in our metabolism, the way we think, the way we move, everything comes down to a protein. So what's a protein? So a protein is a, is a series of amino acids stuck together in a polymer. Amino acids are these molecules. So this, let's just look at this one in the corner here. This is alanine, right? So every, every amino acid has got this motif with a nitrogen, a carbon, a carbon, the oxygen atoms. And then in blue, the, the thing we call the side chain. In this case, it's a carbon with three hydrogens. It's called a methyl group, right? 
And different amino acids differ by these side chains. And we string them together, and that makes a protein. So this list of letters here are the single letter abbreviations right, for all of these different amino acids in this protein chain that happens to be the molecule known as ubiquitin. Right? We might represent it in three-dimensional structure by showing the list of amino acids in this sort of fashion. If I showed you all the atoms, you really wouldn't be able to comprehend what's going on. Now, I've got to tell you a, a cute story. When you're, when you're, if you go back up Prospect Street on your way out, there's a new chemistry building somewhere around 250 Prospect Street, almost at the corner of Everest. And there's this beautiful wrought iron gate. Right? And on that wrought iron gate, we have some peptides made uh, that happen to have these different amino acids. And we have a peptide that is made up of, where's tyrosine? I'm looking for ty tyrosine. Where is my tyrosine? Right there, tyrosine, which is Y, alanine, A, leucine, L, and my glutamic acid, E, Yale. So we have this molecule built and it says Yale on the gate, <laughs> right? And next to it, we have one that says cysteine, right? And then it says, has a histidine, right? Glutamic acid again, and methionine. Where is methionine? Methionine, Yale chem, so it says Yale chem across the gate, right? Now, the artist that made these peptides, uh, when he brought the models over for us to, to look at his artistic rendition of them, um, they were made out of these ball and stick models. And the, the tyrosine, uh, so the tyrosine, uh, yes, the tyrosine he had there, the, the OH that was stuck to the side fell off, right? And he's showing us the model, and we're looking at it. And, and it's a tyrosine, but it's missing an OH. And we thought, that's kind of, something is wrong with this, right? And well, tyrosine without an OH is phenylalanine, which is an F. So instead of Y-A-L-E, it said F-A-L-E, failed chem, right? <laughs> which a lot of the undergraduates here thought would have been more appropriate for us to put up, right? Right. right so, so proteins, you know, the, the, their, their structure is not just this chain. It's how the molecule folds on itself. And we actually use NMR to measure those dipolar fields between the spins, right, to see what's next to what, right? And so we can do that, right? And I need, I need two volunteers. They're going to determine protein structures here. Okay, over here, right, right here, and in the very back in the center. Okay, all right, so, all right, so we have two polypeptide chains here, all right, that we're going to stretch out, all right. Starts with alanine, all right, you come over here, all right, all right, and stretch it out, all right, stretch it out straight. So, in, what we do uh, when we're doing an NMR structure of a protein, all right, is we try to determine what's next to what, all right? So I have two sequences here, and I'm going to show you how I can make two different structures, right, by looking at the constraints, right? So I've done an experiment in case one, right, with my green polypeptide here. And suppose number one, that's my A. Can you see the one there? I want you to take number one and now stick it next to number 20. So find number 20 down the chain and stick it on number 20. I think 20 is right about there, okay? So, so tape that together, all right? Now if I take number two, all right, and let's take number, let's take number four here. Find number four, all right, number four, all right, and I'll stick that next to number 23 if you can. Ah, he's got to curve it around, all right. I don't have long enough pieces of tape. Now this, the tapes aren't strong enough, okay. And now let's, uh, let's take seven, or let's take 10 and put it next to 31, all right. So here's number 10. All right, now let's stick that next to number 31. And if you go on around, all right, and let's do the last one, 14 next to 36. 14 next to 36. Here's 36, and there's 14. Okay, that would say, with those constraints, that the protein should fold up in that sort of a fashion. All right, so he's formed what we would call a helix. All right, now let's suppose instead my experiment had given me a different set of data. And let's look at the bottom here. Let's say one is next to 29. Let's put one next to 29. 29, there's 29's right there. Okay, so let's stick those two together. All right, and then the next one here, let's, well, let's go off to the end. Let's say put 45, let's find 45 and stick that next to 20. All right, oh, can't go that way. Looks like we gotta go back around the other way. Flip around backwards, yep, hold this tight. All right, now stick those two together. Ah, and now if you hold this up, this, the sheet does something else. This is called a helix, this is called a beta sheet. When you have Alzheimer's disease, now, what is it? Ah, yeah. Your protein, instead of forming an alpha helix, forms a beta sheet, right? And the plaques that are formed there are due to the misfolding of the protein. 
So the structures of proteins are very, very important. There are other diseases. Uh, for instance, type 2 diabetes comes about because of a misfolding of a protein. And so using NMR to determine protein structures has been very, very important. You guys can keep those if you want. Right? Right? And so from those restraints, what we do in a computer is we then use the computer to figure out from those restraints what the backbone ought to look like. And if I did this in ball and stick, as I've been showing you, or space filling, you really couldn't tell. But we typically write out the helices in this sort of a fashion, color coded, so we can see the, the curve of the backbone. And we take the sheets and we, we bend them in this sort of a fashion. And, and we get all sorts of pretty pictures right, that come out. And these different protein folds, as we call them, all right, uh, imply what their structure is. And it tells us how they function. We can learn how molecules bind. And so a lot of pharmaceutical companies will try to determine the structures of these molecules to figure out how drugs are going to bind to them. And this led to another Nobel Prize. Uh, we, Kurt Butrick got this. He shared it with the one we heard about this morning, John Fenn, who was just across the way. Right? All right, so there's lots of other big things in NMR, and I don't have time to tell you about them, but you're going to hear about NMR when you learn about quantum computing and spintronics. When you go to Reagan Airport, you'll go through an NQR machine that looks for either cocaine or RDX, which is an explosive in your bags. In Iraq, they're using NQR machines to find landmines. Schlumberger and Ridgefield actually puts NMR machines down in a well. And they can tell the difference between clay, sandstone, oil, which is where I want to drill, and just water. Right? So with that, I uh, hope you've had a magnetic day today. And uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions.